Thanks, Beck. So if you are visiting with us this morning, my name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here at Epicenter Church, and I'd like to make a big warm welcome to all our guests and all um, our visitors. Who's feeling a little bit um, groggy this morning? Like you're just tired, you're lethargic. It seems like one of those days, perhaps everyone went out to the Blues Festival last night, enjoyed some good music. Is that correct? No? Everyone's just feeling lethargic just because you're lethargic. How about everyone stand up? Everyone stand up. And just like these are simple things we used to do in school, wasn't it? When, when, we're, when we're tired and the, and the teacher realized we're tired, they're like, stretch. And so lift your hands to the air. Yep, and just like twiddle your fingers and you can sit down. And that is the end of uh, my exercise assignment. That's as far as I can get. Uh, so, yeah, fantastic. Some people are happy for that. Some people, um, not so much. Yeah, so anyways, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to jump into uh, something that I feel excited to share about, that I feel God's um, placed on my heart now for a little while. And I'm glad that we're here sharing it this morning. So, Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have um, to come and to gather together, Jesus, as a body, Father, as a, as a community, as a group, God. And I pray that um, what I have to share, Jesus, I pray that it in, impacts us here, Father, as much as it has impacted me as I've been um, preparing it and listening to you and diving into it. And so, God, I pray that as I share, Jesus, it's your voice coming through me in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Has anyone discovered like how inconvenient people are? Yeah, like they're people and they're inconvenient. And one would um, summarize that life would be simple if it weren't for people. Yes, and everyone inside, they're like, amen. Yeah, exactly. Other people. Thank you, Paul. So my life would be phenomenal if just me was in it. No one else. And I imagine you guys would say the same thing. My life would be great if X, Y, Z person in particular wasn't in it. Maybe you're a more holy person than, than me and you don't have this, this, this issue. And but it, So um, Sage and I were in Adam and Rebecca Mitchell's link and the end of last year, I think it was, we, we were going through this. And so the links are our small groups if you haven't worked that out. And we, we were going through this study and it was on spiritual gifts. If you're unsure of what spiritual gifts are, that what, what we believe as a church is that um, God empowers um, believers specifically with um, gifts given by Him to us to use for the betterment of the kingdom. And so we're going through the, this study on, on spiritual gifts, and we started the study with, with going through with a spiritual gifts test. And so it, this isn't like 100% what you were going to equate your gifts to, but it's just to kind of get a ballpark of perhaps you, this is your first time studying gifts and Let's have a look at the different gifts and perhaps what you could be. You know, those personality tests? It was like that, but it was like spiritual gifts. And so we went through and I had a fair idea what mine would be, which is great and fantastic. And so we went through and this is the first link and we're, and we're, we're talking about all our things, all our tests, all our gifts and, and everything. And then I don't know what wise person thought this would... I don't know what I'm doing. It's the first time I've got one of these remotes. Can you blank that screen? This thing's not working already. Um, and so, where was I? What was I talking about? Spiritual gifts, test, personality tests. That's Romans 12 up there. We'll get there in a minute. And and anyways, we're, we're going through all these things. And, and um, some smart person had the idea, let's talk about... Um, what we didn't rate, like what was our least possible giftings. And one would believe, or the the thought that often comes is that if you're a pastor, there's certain gifts that just come with it. And so that a pastor would be very, very empathetic. And a pastor would be very, very, um, have a high capacity for mercy and and all, and all have these certain gifts. And, and we went around the room and, and I noted going around the room that everyone's gifts were rather high with, um, with mercy and empathy and pastoring people and wanting to care for people and these things. And then, then it got to me and I shared my, my gifts as a result of that. And then I shared my bottom couple of gifts and it's anything but what you would normally think a pastor would be. So I barely rated on mercy or empathy or care or compassion or anything like anything of, of, of that sort. And um, everyone had a really good chuckle as they said, oh, you're the pastor of the church. Um, 
And so that's not the highlight that I'm a, I'm a bad person, but rather it's the highlight that I actually need you guys because I need your giftings as much as you need mine as well. But to, I suppose to explain, I, I highlight that to explain how my mind thinks with when some situations turn up. And somewhat recently, um, I was working on our farm, like the, the farm my brother and I have, and I was having lunch. And so on my farm days, I go home and have lunch with, with uh, mum and dad and my brother. So we're all kind of there together. And, and as we're having lunch, they, they start talking. So my parents and my siblings, they, they like people. It's not that I don't like people, but they love people and they love helping people and they love doing things um, for people. And, and so there's this um, mutual friend of the family that I believe no one here knows, but I'm not going to mention any names anyways. And they're going through quite a mental health um, dilemma and struggling with a whole lot of things in, in life. And, and they come up with the idea, how about we invite them to live in the city and they're constantly locked in their, in their house and not getting out nothing and they said how about we invite this person to come and they can stay with us they can stay with you they can like they can just do some life and get out of the city and and completely have a complete different life change and and they're highlighting this stuff I'm thinking no this is a bad idea this will this will impede on my life in some description on what I enjoy doing and this is this is not we can't I can't, we shouldn't, I, this is a, a stupid idea and so I'm this is all going through in my head it doesn't mean I, vo- I vocalized any of it. None of it got out of my mouth. Thank goodness I've got a filter that I have built in because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in my head that should never come out of my mouth. And so I didn't vocalize any of it, but I, I was thinking, like, who thinks like this? Like th- this, this guy's going through real struggle street and we've got the perhaps the option, I'm not to say that getting this person out of the city and is going to change everything or anything, but perhaps, perhaps if we were to put ourselves out for a couple of weeks or a month or maybe two months that this person's life would be completely altered. And I'm concerned about me being put out for a little bit. Like this is a short window. This isn't unique for me. My family always have different people come and share Christmas with us, which every time I seem surprised. Every year I'm surprised that there's different people at our Christmas events. I don't know why after, how old am I, 34, 35, one of those two um, years of age, I don't know why I'm surprised, but it happens year in, year out. And every time I get there, I'm like, why is there randoms here for Christmas? Some of you guys have been the randoms, actually, that we've invited. <laughs> Uh, and, and so this is the process that my mind goes through. Like, uh, and then uh, as far as it, like, this is about us. This is for us. This is our Christmas. And they're intruding on our Christmas. My wife's better at this than me. And then, so again, the filter comes. No, you don't, you don't talk like that. You get to love people. You get to connect with people. This is a joyous time and, and all of that sort of thing. And I've come to this understanding that through this, that, that people are inconvenient. Obviously, I find people inconvenient, not all the time. I've probably highlighted it too much to the point where it sounds like I never have good thoughts about people. I have a lot of good thoughts about people as well. I'm just highlighting some of the poorer thoughts that um, track through my ba- brain. I'm far from perfect. But something that I've discovered, which I'm assuming you have as well, is that people are somewhat like inconvenient. Isn't, isn't it the, the time when you need to connect with someone or someone needs your help, the most inconvenient moment? Like you're having arguments with your spouse or you're going through financial difficulties or you've got like struggles of whatever is, is happening and then your friend, your neighbor, your, your, your sibling, your someone, they come knocking on your door and they need you. And it's, it's, it's never at the right time. I've, I've found in life, never have I been at that spot where I, or let me rephrase, never when I'm ready to help someone do they want help. Every time I'm not ready to help someone, they want help when I'm tired, when I don't really want to be at work, when, when life's falling apart, when the kids aren't doing good at school or Sage and I have had an argument or I've just had dilemmas with myself or, or health or something. That's when people seem to come to me for help. And I imagine you found the same thing. People come at the most inconvenient, frustrating times. And the, the, the question is, like, what, what do we do at, at those particular times? It, something I've discovered through this is, regardless of the timing of it, regardless of the personality type, regardless of the feeling or the sensations that come behind these helping people, we have a choice. Isn't life just a succession of choices? Is it my giftings? 
if I go back to my giftings. My giftings may not be that that I am naturally empathetic or naturally caring or, or naturally do I outwork mercy. My, my giftings may not be this, but in every one of those instances, I have a choice. When someone turns up to Christmas and I'm not prepared for it after 34 years, I have a choice to love them. I have a choice to react. I have a choice to, to do something. And what, what I've discovered is that this choice will either go two ways. It will either ignite something as far as it will ignite or give someone the opportunity to have life ignited, or it'll do the opposite. It'll start snuffing life out. Remember that uh, reality TV show, Survivor? It's potentially still on. I don't know. Is it still on? My goodness. <laughs> so, in, in Survivor, if you, like, for the rough handful of episodes that I watched and the different things I watched here and there, it's like they're all on a deserted island and they throw all these people on there and they've got these obstacles that they've got to get through and they've got to survive and then, then and basically they've got to survive the island and the winner does what the winner does. They get something and the, the losers, they get excommunicated off the island. But what what I, I like the pictorial um, picture that comes with it in that, at the end of every day, or at, at, at least at the end of the episodes, the, everyone's lined up there on the beach. And it's a beach, it's picturesque, and everyone's just wearing basically um, bathers because it's that hot and it's comfortable and all of that. And everyone's got a torch beside them. Not, not, a, not a flashlight with a button on it, but it's got a torch with a flame on it. You know the torches I'm talking about? Yeah. A tinky torch. That's the one, yeah. Those things. And, and, so, and then what happens is, as people get voted off, someone comes up with a cup and extinguishes their torch. The torch gets put out. And then they say, you cannot be part of the, this, you've, you've lost survival, whatever, and, and then they get excommunicated. And something that I've come to this um, reality is that my choices with both myself and with people have the opportunity to do one or two things. I'll either work towards extinguishing life or actively igniting it. There's this guy called, uh, like, um, most of you will know him as Paul. Prior to this, he, there was this guy called Saul, and he had this um, desire in life to extinguish as many lights as he could and as many lives as he could. He was um, in, in, the first cent- in the first century in Palestine, Palestine, around that area, and he hated Christians, hated Christians. And he, he, went on, he, he went on this life's mission of trying to put out as many lives as he could of, of Christians. So he'd persecute them. He would drag them out of their buildings. He would beat them. He would stone them. He would murder them. He'd throw them in jail. He'd do all he could to stuff out their light. And then he gets to this point where he discovers he has this incredible encounter with Jesus on Damascus Road where, um, where we read about in the book of Acts where his life is completely flip-sided and he works tirelessly to actively minister to people about Jesus and actively ignite life in individuals. And he writes this letter um, to, the, to this church in Romans, which we know as, as Romans, oddly enough. And he says this, and in starting this letter, in the middle of this letter, he's, he's writing this Roman church, and he, and, he, and, he, and he opens up with this, and he says this from um, Romans 12. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... I appeal to you. I've got something I want to say to you. I appeal to you all by the mercy of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Have you ever discovered that life's not about you? Life hasn't got, like, life's got plenty to do with you, but life's not about you. It, but the, all of this becomes more and more relevant as we age, and perhaps when you become parents specifically, it becomes highlighted more that life's not about me. My time is not just my time. None of it's just for me. Life's not just about us, but rather life's about something else. And, and in, in particular, what the Bible highlights and what the Bible suggests to us is that life is about Jesus. Life is about discovering Jesus. Life is about finding Jesus. Life is about connecting with Jesus. Life is about having Jesus connect with us. And in doing that, something gets ignited, and that is life. We've got, this, we've got this strange idea. You can drop that slide for a second, Matt. Um, we've got this strange idea that in order to gain life, we have to hold on to something. We have to grab at something. We have to get something and draw it into us. Like life is becoming more and more about me, about what makes me feel good, about what makes me feel happy, and what I enjoy, what I want to do. 
what I want to eat, the hobbies that I want to do, and, and life is becoming less and less about anything else other than us. But I've, I've had this thing that I've, I've noted throughout life, throughout my life, and perhaps you've done the same thing, that it's often the things that we release, that we give away, ignite the most life. Like, can, can, can consider this, bungee jumping, jumping out of a plane, anything that it seems that comes with adrenaline activities where you've got to throw caution to the wind and say, you know what, regardless of the consequences, I'm going to do this. And, and w- what people say over and over again when they, when they step into these activities is, I felt so free. While I was doing that, I felt so free. I felt so full of life. I felt like I was limitless. It's because you're casting off restraint and doing something different. Have you noticed that when, when you're stressed, that moment that you can cast off stress, you feel light. You feel free. When you, when you cast off control or anxiety or, or depression or anger or bitterness or, or, or offense, when you throw that away, that you feel light. You feel life. Life starts to be ignited. We have this concept that I'll enjoy life, that I'll engage with life, that I'll experience life. The more that I do for me, but what the Bible teaches and what Paul highlights here is, you know what? If you want your life ignited, this is what you need to do. You need to give it away. This is what Jesus teaches. This is what he, one of, one of, uh, one of his words is that if you want to find your life, you need to lose it. And that looks like handing it over to me so that I can ignite it. So if you put that slide back up, please, Matt. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I want you to do something. I want you to ignite your life. And it happens this way, by offering me yourself, by allowing me to step in, by by allowing me to ignite your life. But your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2 goes on. And it says this, it says, Do not be conformed to this world. As far as do not just do what the world wants you to do. Do not do what the world says is right. Do not be patterned by what the world says. When we were growing up, we had lots and lots of different animals. We had old McDonald's farm. We had a, a sign out the, at the front that said Muscovy Ducks for sale. And we had a camel that used to march up and down the, the channel. And that sign that says Muscovy Ducks for sale has been gone for about 15 years and the camel's been gone for about 25 years. But I still run into people who say, oh, you sell the Muscovy Ducks, don't you? You've got the camel out the road. Like, we were that farm. We were the nuts. We were the nutters of the district. And, and, um, and so we had, and one of the things with animals and with farms, there's always something dying. And there's always something needing mothering. And there's always something needing ca- to be cared for. And like, so for instance, if a, if a cow loses a calf, the last thing that you do are like on a beef producing property is just let the cow go dry because you've got the chance of mastitis, you've got the loss of milk, you've got a whole lot of things uh, taking place. So if you haven't got a calf, you go to the market and you get another calf and you put that calf on the cow. This is our thinking. But some, sometimes this got weird. So for instance, there was this w- one time, and I'm getting, getting somewhere with this, that the, the, the mare, we had a mare that had a foal that lost the foal. And my grandfather in his wisdom, he's like, well, that's perfectly good milk going to waste. And so he got a calf from the market and put the calf on the mare and the mare raised the foal. I mean, the, the mare raised the calf. It's so weird. There was this other time, right, when, when uh, and this was always happening, the hen was sitting on eggs. And just before the, hen, the, the, the eggs hatch, the fox comes and he licks his lips and he has a good time. And he eats the hen, but the eggs survive the attack, right? And so dad said this, like, because, and then at the same time, we had a duck sitting on eggs that were about to hatch as well. So dad said, I will take the eggs from there. I'm going to put it under the duck. And so he does this. And chickens are so smart, aren't they? Like they come out and whatever they look like, look at, that's mum. If they see you, you're mum. So they saw the duck and the duck was mum and so the, the these chickens they hatch and they've got um, brothers and sisters and their brothers and sisters are ducklings and their mums are duck but they're looking at mum like you're a funny looking chicken and she's looking at her like you're funny looking ducklings and there, there's all sorts of stuff going and and we would always keep our chickens and our, our ducklings when they're first born would keep them in the cage so they couldn't get out for a couple of weeks just to let, let them grow and strengthen a bit and and then um dad came one day and he decides it's time for everyone to experience life. And so he opens the door. What do ducks do? Ducks love water, don't they? 
And, and so the duck knows, ex- mother, mother duck, she knows exactly where the water is. And so she and like the, the ducklings got no clue, but they're going to follow mum to the, to the water. And so she starts beelining for like 120 meters to the pond but behind the house. And so behind her are waddling ducklings. And then behind the ducklings are all these waddling chickens. And everyone's like just marching on a mission. This is their first swimming experience. How grand, how fun. And she's probably telling them all the way, this is going to be the best thing you've, ever, you, you've seen. Ducks with that water, they love it. And so as she's going, she's telling them, you're going to love this water so much. And the chicken's like, oh. And then she gets there and, and, the, and, the, and the duck, she just goes straight in the water. And the ducklings, they've never seen water. So they pause for a minute and then they jump. And they jump and they submerge and then they're then they, you know, like, then they're floating again. And the chickens, the chickens did the same thing, but they don't float. They drown. There's feathers, there's wings, there's flapping, there's everywhere. You're trying to rescue them from out of them. Some live, some die. It's like, it's horrendous. Um, some people just follow what the leader, regardless of the cost. And like, you ne- never really think about who's leading them, where they're going, what, what, what they're doing. They just, just follow because oh, I think that's, Right. You know, outside the, outside the world or outside the church, the world has this idea or what constantly gets said is that Christians are like those chickens following that duck. They're not thinking about anything. They, they just conform to whatever the institution says. They're just going, going the way that everyone says that they should go. They're not thinking about things. They're not thinking through things. They're just, they're, they're, they're just being brainwashed and, and doing what they're told to do, pre-programmed to do, what everyone says they should do, they don't think. And so we've got the, there's this idea that, that it, the church people or people inside the church would be like the chicken with the, with the duck and they're not thinking about anything ever. They're not thinking about whether I've been made with, with buoyancy. They're not thinking about whether I've got webbed feet and I can swim. Not thinking about anything like that. And so outside the world, we've got this idea that the church is just constantly making people conform to a certain way of living and never encouraging people to think, which I find somewhat unique in that the church, and like it's not only the church that do this, but predominantly this is what the church advocate, that the church pushes against the grain of what society says is right and what society says we should be doing, what society says we should be going. From, from what I've experienced, outside of the church, and this is not to say outside of the church are evil, wicked, malicious filthy people or anything like that. I'm just to hi- trying to highlight two different modes of thinking. From what I've experienced, the people that are constantly going with the grain that aren't having to think as someone outside the church has never been challenged to think about what you're doing, what you're actively trying to do. So this is how I would look at it. The, the person that is dating someone and chooses not to sleep with their partner before they get married is the person that has actively thought through what they're doing as opposed to actively just going with the grain of life. The person that, that um, has gossip come to them and share with them and shuts down the gossip and refuses to gossip back. I would highlight to you that that is a person that's actually thinking through the grain that they are going to follow. And, and this can go on and on. And, and this is not to say that there's not people outside the church that, that have really good morals or anything of the sort. What I'm trying to highlight is that the, the world and what we specifically get coming and bombarding is, oh, you're just pre-programmed to do that. No, I'm the one that's actively trying to think through what I'm doing. I'm the one that's actively trying to think through what Jesus is teaching me, what he's highlighting to me, because I want my life to be be ignited by his fire, by his life. I want something in my life. So the verse goes on um, with, with um, keep it on chapter two, on verse two, whatever the chapter is of 12. Um, it says, do not be conformed to, the, to this world, other versions, to the pattern of this world. Don't be confirmed to that, but be transformed. My experience is the only people that are being transformed are the people that are deliberately thinking through what they are actively doing and what is getting spoken to them. You with me? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what the will of God is. We all want to know what the will of God is, but very few of us are willing to start at the start. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's a whole other segue that I'm not going to go there. And then it goes, goes on what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Then when we, when we get to verse 9, Paul starts highlighting what it kind of starts looking like to live a life that is 
contrary, that is different, that is going against the grain of what the world is highlighting. And he says this, he says, let love be genuine. And you're like, that's not a big deal. Okay, it's, it's not, it's not a big deal. Anyone can do that. Abhor, abhor, whatever you pronounce that, which basically means this, hate. Hate what is evil. Again, we don't have a big problem with this. This is much indifferent to the world. Hold fast to what is good. We have no problems with this. It's relatively easy to let love be genuine, specifically when you love that person or you connect with that person or you, you care for that person. It's easy to hate what is evil. I don't think there's, there's not too many people, there will be some, but there's not too many people that rejoice over what Hitler did or Stalin did or anything like that or the other atrocities that have happened throughout the world. We, we're pretty good at hating what is evil. We're pretty good at holding fast to what is good. That's somewhat simplistic and, and easy. If it's good, I'm going to hold on to it at, at all means. Love one another with brotherly affection. Again, oh, man, this stuff isn't too difficult, but then this is where it starts getting tricky. Outdo one another in showing honor. Back to the start where, where he says, I urge you to present your bodies as a sacrifice. Life isn't about us. We've created life about us where we are the ones that are, we are wanting the honor. We're wanting the report. We're wanting people to notice us. But he starts saying here, I want you to outdo one another in showing honor for the simple reason I want you to ignite life in someone else. I've already told you that I want you to offer your bodies to Jesus to allow Him to ignite life in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, in your every, everything. I've already told you that, that I want you to not conform to how the world does things because I want life ignited in you. And now I want you to help other people ignite life. And so He says, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Verse 12 continues on. It says this, it says, rejoice in hope. And back again, we're like, that's not a big deal. But then he says, be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and, and seek to show hospitality. None of that's too hard. And then he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So he's saying, you know what? When someone is annoying you and someone is putting you down for what you believe, when someone is all of that, I want you to bless them. I want you to pray for them and this is now where it starts looking a whole lot different to how the world suggests that we do things how the world would suggest that if someone persecutes you you persecute them back when someone slaps you you would slap them back when someone hurts you you make sure you get something back and so he starts highlighting something different verse 15 he continues on rejoice with those who rejoice and again we're back at the dilemma it's isn't life about me? How, how many of people know those that person? That So he says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. How many know that person where you go to them? It's just, it's been one of those days. It's been a phenomenal day, a phenomenal week. It's been a great year. It's been great something. And you go up to this friend, this someone, this whoever, and you highlight to them all the good that has happened. And, and, and they've got the opportunity to rejoice with you. In your rejoicing. And they, they plat, pat you on the back and like, that is phenomenal. This is what happened to me this week. How good's this? This is what I've been doing. How good's this? And then they start grabbing your rejoicing and start turning your focus to, how about you rejoice on my achievements? They start promoting their own accolades, what they've achieved, what they've done. They start forgetting about you. Or perhaps you've experienced a person that it's the opposite. It's you're grieving, you're weeping, you're upset, you're mourning, you're going through crisis and, and you go to them for support and comfort. And, and, you, and you're like, I'm going through this. This has happened. I need help. I need love. I need support. And this, you may not say that and you just highlight what's been going on in your life. And then they again, they, they rub you on the back this time. They don't pat you on the back. You're like, my gosh, that's hard. I really feel for you. And then at some point in the conversation, they turn it around to their hurt, to their struggle, to their pain, to the thing that they're grappling with. We have this struggle that we all go through of we're constantly wanting to turn the focus back on ourselves because we have this perspective that for me to ignite life means that everything has to have or be focused around me rather than around someone else. And in specific, someone else being Jesus. Or in the, the case of when someone's 
rejoicing? How about we ignite life and rejoice with them? Nothing to do with me. Not to show honor to myself. Let's outdo one another in showing honor and just rejoice. When someone's grieving, it's not about my grief, what I'm going through. Let's outdo one another in showing honor and be deliberate with grieving with them, loving them through it. It's not about me. It's about that particular person. For the whole reason, I think he's, Paul's highlighting this, is because I want you to ignite life in other people. The verse goes on. Live in harmony with one another. Not too hard. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for e- no one evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. There's so much here to unpack that we're not even going to start. If possible, he says, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So much in there. And then he gets to this point in 19. And he says, beloved, never avenge yourselves. People, like I said at the start, they're irritating. They're frustrating. They're annoying. They're difficult. They stab you in the back, don't they? Anyone had someone close to you stab you in the back? You can drop that slide for a second. Anyone had a, had a wife or a husband or a brother or a sister hurt you? It's not fun. It's not nice. But we all have that because we all have interactions with people. And so some of us have had co-workers, we've had family members, we've had friends, we've had all these different sorts of people come and hurt us and, and actively destroy something and hurt something in us. And, and our natural response and the response that the world would tell us to do is, well, you get to get your own back. Recently, Sage and I have cattle and... I, like I divided all the different mobs and I put one mob in, in this and I was bordering the neighbors and the neighbors had a couple of um, hundred head of a on. And I counted them and there was 24 in the, in the paddock. And I went back and, and I was driving past one day, sorry, and, and they were all like, you know, animals are very social creatures. And so everyone's come and they've communed at the fence. And the Black Angus are staring at mine and everyone's having this big powwow right by the fence. And I thought, this doesn't look good. Someone's going to jump the fence at some point. But I thought, it's, it's no, no big deal. We'll, we'll work it out when it happens. Anyways, I went back the next day and I counted 23. And I thought I saw a foreigner over the fence. And I think, that foreigner's mine. Now, I couldn't, in all honesty, now I'm repeating the story. I can't 100% say that it was 24 in the paddock to start with. But I'm 98% sure that there was. Very convinced that there was. And very convinced that the black and white Frisian that was wandering around with the Angus that looked like it should have been with my other Frisians was mine. And so I, like, we, we rang the guy and I said, I think one of my cattle's got in with yours. He said, yeah, no, no worries. We'll be mustering them in a, in a month or so and, and going through. And if it, it will, we'll give it back. Fantastic. Anyways, he, he rings me about a month later and he said, nope, 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 nope. There's, there's, there's none. Like, you haven't lost any. Ah. <sighs> Well, you, like they're not branded, they're just ear tags, so it's not hard to cut an ear tag out and put another one back in. This I cannot, I cannot prove one way or another. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. And then I had opportunity to get my own back. All of a sudden, this black Angus appears. This beautiful looking cow. She comes wandering in, and I, I, I don't know where she turned up from, but I saw her climb into with my cattle. And so I'm looking at her in the paddock, and and. I, and I couldn't work out where she'd necessarily come from, but I was pretty sure she'd come from the adjacent place. And, and I'm looking at it, and, I, and this, this is, here's my brain again. And I start thinking, I'm pretty sure they took one of mine. I'm going to make mine back. So I, I won't say anything. I'll just leave this. I won't do anything about this. I, I will sell her at the next sale. I'm going get to this, get this back. And these, this is the thoughts going through my head. And then I say to myself, I can't do this. And then I talk to Sage about it, and she said, you can't do that. I wouldn't never have acted on it, but it was definitely a thought that was going through. And, and anyway, anyways, like, thank goodness I didn't act upon it because it happened to be someone else's, not even theirs. So it was, it was a really good thing. But I, what, what, I've, what I've noticed is that when someone hurts me, when someone stabs me in the back, when someone does something that, that I don't appreciate or, or like, it's, it's not enough just to get dollar for dollar, is it? Like when, when someone hurts you and it's done X, Y, Z, it's not enough just to get that back. You want them to feel the same pain that you just felt. When someone stabs you, you want to stab them, literally. If someone's made you cry, you want to make them cry in, in some 
way, shape, or form. Like we, it's not enough just get dollar for dollar back. We want to get the same feeling back. We want them to feel what we felt. If you put that slide back up, Paul says this, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. And it's about this point because we all have people that irritate us in the world would say, it's your right to avenge yourself. They've done this. That was wrong. You shouldn't do They shouldn't have done this. It's your right to do that. And then Paul says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. He's like, nah, I don't get to do it. I don't get to keep that beast. And it says, never avenge yourselves, but leave it for the wrath of God. And we start getting excited about now. Because you start thinking the wrath of God is better than anything that I've got in my pocket that I can unleash on a person. He's going to come with lightning bolts and he's going to strike them. It's going to be like a million knives in the back, not just one. It's going to be so good. And it says, for it is written, vengeance is mine. He's like, oh, God's taking my offense and he's acting out on it on my behalf. Vengeance is mine. I will repay and we start getting excited, or at least maybe my mind does. And then, and then, then Paul says, to the contrary, and we read this and we think, to the contrary, there is no contrary. There is none. This is just good stuff as far as God's doing stuff. And Paul says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. You're like, oh my gosh, I've actually got to do some stuff again. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. I'd rather not. So he would like just die of thirst. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And you get to this point and you're like, yes, I get it again. This is fantastic. I get to love someone in such a way that burns their skull. You can drop that slide. And maybe this is just the way that I've interpreted it for the majority of my life. That, that we get to love people, if we outwork this actively loving people, as far as if we outdo showing honor to someone, if we actively pray to, to bless them and not curse them and all of that, 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 that our acts of love to that individual will be like us taking hot coals and burning it on their head, piling it on their head. It'll hurt them. It'll frustrate them. It'll do all that. That's, honestly, that's actually how I've um, interpreted it all my life, till somewhat recently. My understanding has always been that if I outwork this type of love, then I will get vengeance in, in someone. And man, this is making me sound like a very malicious person. I'm actually not a malicious person. I don't normally have bad thoughts about people, just sometimes. And um, interesting to note, though, what quite a number of scholars would, would say in, in interpreting that. And, and because what Paul's doing there, he, he, he is, um, he's repeating what Proverbs says. And so, so one idea perhaps with that, or one idea that constantly gets put forward with that, is that in the ancient times, like fire equaled life. If you didn't have fire, you couldn't cook. And if you couldn't cook, then you'd, unless you were happy to eat raw food all the time, it wasn't going to be a very pleasant existence for you and you'd potentially die. Fire was warmth. Fire was food. Fire was everything. And so, and people didn't just cook with big fires, they predominantly had coals, coal bases that they'd have on the ground and then they'd cook over the coals, they'd, they'd warm pots, they'd boil water, they'd, they'd cook food, they'd cook everything over these, these coal base. And so every now and then though, your coal base would go out and you'd have to reignite it, but it wasn't as simple. There wasn't matches, there wasn't fire lighters that you light, that you throw in you pretend to be a bushman but you're really not you're just putting like vapor on there and making it go um there was none of that you had there was a big effort to light fire and so so what someone would do that they would take their pot they would like take a, a jar they can carry it in they would go to their neighbor and they'd say can i have some coal and then the neighbor would give them a couple of pieces of coal they'd lift that coal up they'd put it on the head in the bowl and then they'd take it back and then they would place it back in their fire and they'll start blowing on it until that coal got warm and then their fire would be reignited their life would be ignited their light would be ignited 
And so by doing that, by going to the neighbor and grabbing something and bringing it back and, and putting it on their coal, they had the opportunity for life to be reignited, to be recooked, to be all of the rest. And so what this is highlighting here isn't that, you know what, if you heap coals on someone's head, it's going to be a way of getting back. Rather, if you heap coals on someone's head, you're offering them an opportunity to ignite their life. So if we love people in, in such a way that we connect with them, if we love people in such a way that we are absolutely loving them with all genuineness, because we want to see them better, regardless of what they've done to us. If we do that in such a way, it's like offering them coals that they can take, that they can take back to their fire, tip it on their fire and have something ignited in their life. The gift of Jesus. Isn't this what happened to us? While we're still enemies of God, while we weren't interested in God, while we're still immersed in sin, doing our own thing, doing what we wanted to do, not what God wanted to do, isn't this what God did for us? He sent us a form of coal being Jesus. And he said, if you take this and if you put this on your head and if you take this back and you put it in, into your thing, into, into your coal base, you've got the opportunity to ignite life. That's what Jesus did for us. He gave us the opportunity to have life ignited. And what Paul's trying to highlight to us here is twofold. The, number one is that he wants our lives to be ignited not extinguished to move through life constantly being ignited and reignited and reignited not because necessarily it's going out but more fuel keeps getting put in the in the tiki can or in the, whatever it's called it constantly kept getting filled up so the life isn't ignited from us and he, and he highlights to us at the start i want you to offer your bodies as a sacrifice completely handed over to jesus allow him to do something i need you to give this to him allow him to ignite it and then from there i don't want you to live how the world wants you to live but rather i want you to live contrary and completely different to that i want you to live how i'm asking you and calling you to live because i want life to be ignited in you and i want you to have the opportunity to ignite life in other people and so I, I wonder for us what would it look like specifically with that individual that my gosh we just struggle with perhaps it's a work colleague perhaps it's a spouse perhaps it's a friend it's a family member Perhaps there's someone you just have to interact with every other day. That they're constantly frustrating you. They're inconvenient. They're 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 just they're, they're a constant struggle street in your life. They're a hindrance constantly. I wonder what would happen, specifically with that individual, if we were deliberate when they were throwing stuff at us, like figuratively, not not literally. That work colleague, that's someone that's they're starting to persecute you or you're going through hard times or tribulations based on what's happening in your life. People are throwing stuff at us. I wonder what would happen if we were genuine with our love for them and, 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 and started to pray for them. Started to pray that they would be blessed. Regardless of how deeply we've been cut, that, that, that they are blessed, that God's love, that God's favor is shining down on them. I wonder what would change in our heart that they'd be able to see wonder what would happen if if we're deliberate without doing one another and showing honor if we actively lived that out of our lives in our day-to-day -day lives in our workplaces in our families in our interactions with people in the supermarkets in the service stations in in different places if we were actively deliberate in outdoing one another and showing honor and showing them you know what my life's not about me my life is about serving jesus and he wants to connect with you and he's got some coals that he wants to highlight or he wants to hand over to you. I wonder what would happen, not only in our lives, but the people around us, if we would be able to offer to people the coal that's been placed in our hands, to hand it to them, that life could be ignited for them. I don't know about you, but this is something that I've been exceedingly challenged with over the last couple of months as I've been preparing this. How deliberate am I in allowing Jesus to move through me to ignite life in others? How deliberate am I in offering myself to Jesus to use and so forth? How deliberate am I to actively walking about igniting life? 
perhaps for you th- this morning, I'm, I want to give you an opportunity to respond um, to this. But you've never actively made that decision to say, you know what, I want to offer my body as a sacrifice to God. I want to hand it over to Him. I want to allow Him to ignite life in my heart. Perhaps you're here, you're watching online, and you just feel this pull. I want my life ignited. I'm going to ask everyone to um, stand up, please. And this is, I'll give you an opportunity to pray this in a minute, but all the prayer that I want you to do is just say, Jesus, ignite my life. Perhaps that's not you. You're not that person, but, but you've had this realization that I'm living life conformed to the pattern of how the world wants to do things, not to the pattern of how Jesus wants to do things. And I want my life ignited with His Spirit, with His love, with His grace, with His mercy. And you want to say the same prayer, but it's not because you want to accept Jesus for the first time, but rather you want your life reignited with Him because you want it to be, you want your life ignited with His pattern rather than the world's pattern. I want you to say the same prayer. Jesus, ignite my life. So if everyone's head, heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you and, and this is um, spoken to you in any way, shape or form, I just want you to whisper this prayer, say this prayer, think this prayer, however it is that you feel to do, I just want you to say, God, ignite my life. If that's you this morning, that's where you're at. I just want you to say, God, ignite my life. Jesus, Jesus, ignite my life. If that's where you're at, I don't want you to leave this morning without saying that prayer. Just whisper it under your breath. Just declare it however it is. Jesus, ignite my life. I want you to come in. I want you to ignite every part of me. This bitterness that I feel, this offense that I feel, this struggle that I feel towards someone, Father, I want you to come in. I want you to deal with that. I want you to remove that, Father. I want you to come in and and purge me of everything that you don't want in there. I don't want to be conformed to how the world wants to do things. I want to be conformed by your presence, by your spirit, by how you're asking me and calling me to live. Father, come and ignite my life. If that's you this morning and you've prayed that prayer, can I encourage you just with everyone's eyes closed, I just want you to lift your hand and I want to pray for you. Perhaps you've, you've said it for the first time. Fantastic. Perhaps you, you've said it for the hundredth time. But if that's you, lift your hands up high. I want to I want to be able to pray for you. Fantastic. If there's any others, lift your hands. I want to be able to pray for you. Fantastic. Okay, you can put your hands down. Our Holy Spirit, I pray um, for every single one of us, regardless of whether we lifted our hands or, or not, but specifically for those that lifted their hands as well as for those that, that lifted their hands in, in their hearts, Father. God, I want to I want to pray that their lives are ignited with your light, Father. For those that have uh, made a first time decision, Father, to to follow you, to have you move and direct and navigate their lives, Father, I pray that you're igniting every part of their body, every part of their spirit, every part of their emotions right now, Father. That you're touching them, that you're ministering to them, Father. For everyone else that that lifted their hand as well, that just want their lives consistently reignited with your presence, with your goodness, Father. I pray, Holy Spirit, that, that, um, that you move in and through them, Jesus. You transform their dreams. You, you transform their way of thinkings, Father. As they, as they hand their life consistently over to you, Father, that you step in, that you rewire how they think as they constantly look to how you are calling them to live rather than how the world lives, Father. And I pray that as they do that, Jesus, I pray that they see the, the individuals around them that they're struggling with. Not just get over things, Father, but have their lives be ignited by your life. I want to pray for everyone else, God, um, that didn't raise a hand, Jesus. I want to pray that all of us are deliberately asking and allowing you to ignite our lives, Father, that we're never conformed to how this world's wanting us to live, but we're constantly being conformed to, um, to how you're calling us and asking us and guiding us to live, Father, and we're constantly being transformed by that way of thinking, Jesus. And I pray that as we consistently step in and do that, Father, that you are stepping in and that you are igniting our hearts, you're igniting our spirits, and you're igniting our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you... um. Li-